Everyone has an authority. Everyone. Everyone has a leader above them. So let's conclude it. We all have authorities in our life, right? And those authorities were given to us by God as His design so that we can learn from and become authorities to those underneath us. Let's turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 18. The title of this message is The Value of Our Authorities. Now, I know that this is not going to be one of those popular sermons, but <laughs> I believe we can still learn something from this. Now, the birthday of Queen Victoria, it was on May 24th when she was born, and all of Canada, in one form or another, will celebrate it. In fact, we are probably going to celebrate it tomorrow, right? And it's usually placed on the first Monday before her birthday, because she was born on a Sunday back in England, in Canada, where a day, you know, where a day after. So we decided, all right, well, we will, uh, we will uh, celebrate her birthday on the Monday, okay? So after, what happened with Queen Victoria is interesting, because why did we choose to uh, celebrate Queen Victoria specifically? Uh, what, what's so significant about her compared to anyone else, Right? You know, Queen Victoria, her birthday became an official holiday in Canada back in 1956. So was there no Queen Victoria Day before that? No, well, in fact, there was Queen Victoria Day, and people celebrated it in one way or another. They loved Queen Victoria. Canada loves Queen Victoria. And here's the reason why. When Canada was divided into two... If you know the history of Canada, there was a time when Canada was divided into an upper Canada and a lower Canada. The lower Canada was a French-speaking Canada, and then the upper part was an English-speaking Canada. The French part was belonging to France. The English was belonging to, well, the English. But eventually, what they decided to do and this was Queen Victoria specifically, she gave rights to both parties. And because of that, Canada loved her. In fact, on that day of her birthday, Canadians, back in all, all the way back to 1845, you can, find, uh, you can find records that Canadians would come out into the streets and sing, God save the Queen. This is interesting because... Canada loved this queen, Victoria. And I think we can all agree that at some point or another, we like to have a, a king or a queen's birthday to be celebrated because we get a day off, right? It's nice. It's all honestly nice. We get, we get that long weekend and everything. And it is a way, in, to a certain degree, it is a way that we get to honor our queen. Now, she has passed a while back. But the thing is, God has placed authorities, kings and queens, and authorities in our lives. They're very specific to us. More and more these days, though, people are lashing out against certain authorities that were once placed in their lives. In fact, there is a global market research agency called Ipsos. And what they did was they did a survey near the end of uh, the year 2022. And the survey was whether the current king or the coming king, King Charles, back in 2022, would do a good job or not. Only 54% believed that King Charles would do well. But the rest of the 46% even went as far as saying we should cut ties with the monarchy completely. But leaders are there for a reason. Authorities are placed in our lives for a reason. In verse 16, if you caught it, you look at verse number 16, we see that there's even a hierarchy of authorities. But above all of them is Jesus Christ, who holds them together. You may be asking yourself then, well, Pastor Deviant, what if I don't like my leaders? What if I don't like my authorities? 
What if our authorities are total tyrants like Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin? What if they're terrible leaders? Now, did you know that God actually teaches us the principles in the Bible of how we ought to live if our, if our leaders were tyrants? God also teaches us how we can honor our authorities so that God can open the windows of heaven to bless us. I think these are blessings that are on the table for us to benefit from, but they can only be gotten if we're able to honor our authorities the way God tells us to. So in order to find this out, let's pray and open up this message. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today, and thank you, Lord, for everyone here. Indeed, Lord, you've gathered us here to hear this message, and Lord, I don't know where everyone's hearts are, but I pray, Father, that you would apply this message into our hearts, wherever it is. We, Lord, maybe it's not about our world leaders, but perhaps it's just the leaders that are placed directly in our life, how we can honor them too. I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts right now, and Holy Spirit, that you would speak through me in this message. I thank you and praise you, Lord. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, one of the first things we learn about our authorities is that they are there to minister to us. Minister meaning they are there to help us. Okay? I'm sure one of you or many of you have received a letter from the government. And when the letter comes in, oftentimes there's a heading and it will tell you the Ministry of Finances. The Ministry of National Defense. I don't know if you are getting that. But many, other, many of the branches in the government are called ministries. Why? Because they are there to help us. They exist to help us. Right? They're there to minister to us. And in fact, let's turn to Romans chapter number 13. Romans chapter number 13. And look at verse number 3 and 4. So Romans chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, it says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You see, many of us, I think, may have immigrated to Canada at some point in our lives. Now, I'm just going to tell you from my perspective. Before I was born, I, the country of Sri Lanka, that's where I'm from. The country of Sri Lanka was going through civil war. And my parents were from both sides of the war. In fact, they had to flee to Japan in order to get married. Otherwise, they would be killed. So they were supposed to have me in Japan. And in fact, the grandparents were even angry at each other. But eventually, they reconciled. And they eventually allowed my mom to come back to Sri Lanka. So I, I ended up being born back in Sri Lanka again. But my parents knew that they didn't want to raise me in Sri Lanka. In fact, the first language they taught me was English because they made a vow that they were going to leave the country because that's not a place to raise your children. So they saw America and Canada as that land of opportunity to come to so that they can raise their child. And the thing is, I'm going to tell you this, in Sri Lanka, the leaders of, of, of that time were not there to help people. I mentioned that the leaders are there to minister to people, but those leaders were not there to minister to people. They were in it perhaps for their own reasons. But trust me when I tell you, Canada is not that bad. Canada is not that bad. And yes, perhaps there are people who are set in our leaderships that are perhaps there for their own reasons. Perhaps that's true. But I'm going to tell you this. If you knew the significance of where 
this verse, these verses came from. The book of Romans. Who wrote it and who he wrote it to. It was the Apostle Paul writing to Christians during the Roman Empire. Now, if you know your history, you would know the Romans were very nice to the Christians, right? No. Terrible. They were terrible. In fact, some historians even would tell you it was the worst time to be a Christian. But you know what? Here we see there was even a Roman emperor named Emperor Nero. How many of you have heard of that? Nero. If you knew Nero, Nero hated Christians. Nero hated Christians to the point where he would publicly humiliate them. He would publicly persecute them. Nero built a Colosseum. And this Colosseum, he would sometimes solely use Christians to light it up. How light it up? He would douse the Christians in tar and set them on fire to use as lamps around the Colosseum. Nero was a twisted man. And here we see Paul telling Christians, the Roman Christians, obey your government. You see, I even found a little more. There was letters that were gathered later on in, through archaeology. And what they found was one of the early church fathers named Tertullian. He wrote some letters around 150 A.D., and Tertullian's letters were gathered into this book called an Apology. Now, this is not the Apology like, oh, I'm so sorry. No, it was Tertullian giving a reasoning as to why Christians acted the way they did. If you knew, Christians were commanded, not only Christians, all Romans were commanded to worship the statue of Caesar and to burn incense to Caesar. So Tertullian was explaining, this is why Christians don't do it. And here is an exact quote from that book. Without ceasing for all emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire, for protection to the imperial house, for brave armies, a faithful senate, a virtuous people, the world at rest, whatever as man or Caesar an emperor would wish. Isn't that stunning? Recorded in history is a prayer from one of the earlier church fathers praying for the emperor who would also kill him. Isn't that insane? He prayed for their leaders and the nation. Our situation, honestly, could be a whole lot worse. We can be thankful to God for what we have and pray for our leaders, for our authorities. In uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 3, you don't have to turn there. But it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. It is God's will for us to pray for our authorities. This is an act of faith. Because honestly, I'm going to tell you, your, your flesh doesn't really want to do that. When somebody does you wrong, your flesh doesn't really want to pray for them. Okay? You are not nat naturally, any creature wouldn't want to go and pray for the one who hurt them. Your flesh doesn't want to do that. But we fail to remember when they actually do something right, too. We can thank God for the leaders and the authorities that are placed above us. The principalities or the powers or all those ministers that are part of making sure that our country is safe. All those people that ensure that our country is being taught well. All those people who are ensuring that our health is well. We can thank God for that. We can thank God because they are ministers to us. And that's our first point. God places authorities in our lives to minister to us. The second point is God's, it's God's design to place leaders for each generation. Now, if you're in Romans chapter number 13, take a look at verse number 5. 
chapter 13, verse number 5, it says, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now, what this is explaining is that we have a duty to uphold also. We have a duty to uphold for man toward God. If we are born-again Christians, we have conscience, we have a conscious duty to uphold and obey the law. This may sound easy, but it's actually quite a challenge. Oh, obey the law? Isn't that easy? Well, think about it this way. How many of us like to uh, obey the speed limits? <laughs> How many of us feel like those are more like suggestions? You know, how many of us may have jaywalked here and there once in our lifetime? And this is becoming bigger and bigger. How many of us would have gone and looked into piracy as a solution for entertainment? You know, think about the times when in our life we thought about things and we did things when no one was watching, right? Because yes, it is one thing to, do, to not do something when we know somebody is watching, but it's a whole different thing when nobody's watching. You see, it also matters when we may not get caught and punished. And that's the thing. Everyone has a conscience. And the thing is, we can train our conscience to be able to look over certain things and not pay attention to other things. But... Did you know that you can mess up your conscience to a point where it will never give you any guilt? But thank God, it can also be reversed. When I was growing up, when someone would do something, this is before I got saved, when someone would do something and I was astonished, wow, oh my, right? And I would not think about it. I wouldn't think about it. But then after I became a believer, after I became a Christian, and I realized how powerful and how holy the name of God is, I started realizing when I ask, or when I say, oh my, and then say God's name, what I'm asking is God come and witness what I have said just now, or what I have heard just now. Should God be called for something that is flippantly said for fun? So I started asking myself, well, maybe, maybe I should stop saying that and just replace the word, the name of God, with perhaps another word. And I, the word was gosh. But then I realized even the word gosh, is an, it's called a euphemism. Because in my heart, I knew what I really meant. Gosh is just a euphemism of God's name. So I realized, maybe I should stop saying this as well. And eventually even came to goodness. Well, the Bible even says, only God is good. And I started to try and cut that out as well. Eventually, what I realized is, I better just cut it all out. Because there is no reason I need to bring God to witness something that I need to say. There's no reason for it. And truth is, my conscience, was, my conscience was starting to change. We have to recognize that our conscience also exists to sort of police us, to help us to stay on the straight and narrow. And to sin against conscience is just as bad in God's eyes. Christians have an obligation. We have an obligation to obey that conscience and to the laws of the land. We have to obey them. And why? Because we recognize that the people who put those laws in place were doing it in the place of God. That's how we see it. In fact, Proverbs 21, verse 1 and 2. Let's turn there. Proverbs. Proverbs 21, verse 1 and 2. It says... Oh, I can hear some pages flipping here. So Proverbs 21, verse 1 and 2, it says, The king's heart is in the hand 
of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. See, as uh, when we try to devise ways, when we try to scheme around rules, you know what's happening? It's as if we're trying to do the same to God. We're trying to get around God's rules. And as adults, we know this now more than ever. There was a time when we thought perhaps that after school was done and everything, I'm not going to have authorities. I'm going to be my own boss and everything's going to go the way I want it to go. No. <laughs> we got into college and we got into university and now we have, we have these deadlines we have to uphold and, and we have to get all these things. But after that, after that, I'm going to get my own job and I'm going to be my own man. No. We were given a boss. And then the boss tells us to do things, and it's like, okay, well, uh, at some point I'm going to start my own business, and then I'm going to be the boss of my own life. No. Turns out there's a government I have to give my duties to. <laughs> you know? So everyone eventually realizes there's a leader placed above us every time. Let's turn back to Romans. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that, are, that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You see, when we were children, we may have recognized that there were authorities in our life. They were given to us. But, they, uh, but then when we look at our parents, and sometimes we would see, oh man, our parents don't do everything that uh, you know, their authorities tell us to do, tell them to do. We see our parents doing something, but then our parents are the ones authorities over us. And then perhaps at some point, we said, well, our parents are not doing it. Why should we? See, when parents are rebellious towards the authorities placed over them, how could they expect their children to be following their parents? In Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, you don't have to turn there, but it says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. The principle that the Bible is trying to teach is we may sow a tiny seed. We may have put a little bit into it. But when it's time for harvest, what we receive will be far bigger. And what we have seen almost as a pattern is the issues that, have, that the parents have had, the children will somehow suffer the same. Why does the world seem to be getting worse and worse. Perhaps we should have started examining ourselves. God places authorities over us for us to learn from so that we can honor him. And after that, we could be examples of those authorities to the following generations as well. And then, thirdly, there are not just one type of leader, but believe it or not, there are many types of leaders that God talks about. And that's our third point. How do we lead then? So let's turn to Ephesians. How do we lead and who are the leaders? So chapter 4, let's look at first verse number 6. Chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 6, it says, One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. So what we see first, right off the bat, and perhaps we all knew this, but God is above all. He is the greatest leader, right? Okay, we know that. Now let's look at verse number 11. 
And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now we also see that church leaders are given to the church to lead the church. They come in forms of pastors and teachers. Okay? And then let's keep going. Chapter number 5, verse 22 to tw- and 23. So chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So, husbands lead the wives. Okay, let's keep going. Chapter 6, verse number 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. All right, so we see that wives and husbands, the parents, are the leaders of the children. Okay, let's keep going. One last one. Chapter 6, verse number 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. This is for, for supervisors, for managers, for bosses that have, that have laborers under them, or who have servants under them. We see that there is a pattern that God has given, and there's different types of leaders. And when it all comes to how we should accept and leader, the leadership of a government, Romans 13, 7 says, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Everyone has Our an authority. Our conclusion here is everyone. Everyone has a leader above them. So let's conclude it. We all have authorities in our life, right? And those authorities were given to us by God as his design so that we can learn from and become authorities to those underneath us. But what does this also all boil down to? What does this all summarize to? The law of the harvest. And I was like, what? The law of the harvest? What's that? Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Take a look at it. This is the last time I'll make you turn, I promise, okay? I'm sure many of you have heard this before. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. How does the law of the harvest affect how we obey our authorities? I'm sure if I asked any of the young people, right, how many of you would like to have a happy relationship with your bosses or those who are above you? I'm sure a majority of them, at least, would say, yeah, I would like to have a good relationship with those who are my leaders. Okay. If I ask the older generation, how many of you would like to have a good relationship with those who are under you? Whether you're a parent, whether you're a boss. I'm sure many of you, maybe all of you, would put your hands up. Now, I'm convinced that if we honor our authorities, that our authorities would be more considerate of us. Does that make sense? I'm convinced that if those under us honored us, that we would feel inclined to look out for their well-being. Right? When I started this message, I started talking about Queen Victoria and how Canada loved Queen Victoria. In fact, they turned it into a holiday because of how she treated the Canadians of the early 1800s. Celebrating birthdays of our authorities is not such a bad idea. To honor them is not such a bad thing. I know that there are groups, cults, and some other, uh, some other Christians even that have very strong opinions about birthdays. But I want to say birthdays are actually okay. They're even biblical. 
The Jehovah's Witnesses cult, they hold to the, the idea that uh, we shouldn't celebrate Christmas even. But birthdays are important. Psalm 118, verse 24, it says, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. If every day is a gift from God, how much more a year? Right? How much more is a year that God has given you? Should we rejoice? And here's another one. In Genesis chapter 40, verse 20, Here's the story. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. You see, there was restoration in the kingdom. There was rejoicing in the kingdom. Everyone rejoiced. It was good. It was a good thing. We also have in the story of Job that he would make... Uh, he would make sacrifices on, the, on his kids' birthdays to God. Sacrifices were a good thing to God. We also know, and we see, we all know who Justin Trudeau is. But I want to ask, do we pray for him? And if we were to pray for his birthday, does anyone know when Justin Trudeau was born? Would any of us ever think to pray for our leader on the day he was born? If you want the answer, he was born on December 25th. Ah. So ladies and gentlemen, let's pray for our authorities. Whether it's our national leader, whether it's our parents, whether it's our boss, whether it's the people who minister to us in the government seats, let's pray for them. Listen to and obey our parents and our pastors. Our pastors are also authorities. So listen and obey. And then you finally submit to them as you would submit to God. It's a hard task. It's something done by faith. But let's not be like the world. Because the Bible calls the world the children of disobedience. Christians ought to know ought to be known as children of obedience. I have a small story and then I'm going to conclude. Back in 2017 in New Zealand, a girl named Rachel and a group of six of her friends were attending Flochella. Flochella was some kind of music festival where people would float while they listened to their music. Well, with her friends and all, they had gone someplace and then they decided they're going to go back home. Well, because it was a festival, there was a lot of traffic that day. So to, in order to try and dodge the traffic, they decided, well, Rachel, who was part of this group, she decided, hey, I have an idea. I found this secret place where we can have a kind of pool party before we leave. What do you think? And all the friends thought about it, and then they said, yeah, let's do it. Okay. So they got to this place, and there was a bunch of trails and then there was some trails that were off the beaten path, you know, that where somebody had just made that trail. It didn't actually, wasn't actually a part of the, of the actual place there. So they started going down this thing. And eventually, some of them heard a siren, an extremely loud siren for 30 seconds. And then they, they were shocked at first, and they didn't know what to do. But then they realized, okay, well, nothing happened. Siren's okay, let's keep going. Now they're hiking a little more down this off path. Eventually they hear another siren, same exact way, 30 seconds long, but then after the siren is done, nothing happens. Now Rachel and all, Rachel was the leader of this group and she decided to tell them, well, nothing happened, let's just keep going. They finally got to this this point of uh, where they can swim. It was like a small pool. The water was pretty shallow so they could, you know, enjoy themselves. What they didn't realize is that that pool was at the end of this long river that had dried up. That's significant because one more time, as they were enjoying themselves in the pool, they heard the siren. 30 seconds, and they thought, or they expected, nothing to happen. 
Well, one of the guys in the group looks up, and down the creek, or up the creek, I should say, he can see this giant wall of white. And what was happening is that a giant amount of water was coming down this river at an incredibly high speed, and it was starting to fill up this pool. What they estimated was it was about 65,000 liters per second were coming down from that river. And what they didn't realize is that at the top of that river was a dam that opens up. 65,000 liters per second of water would start filling up. And now eventually, they are now battling against nature. They are battling against all this water coming down. Eventually, only three of the friends in that group end up surviving. Rachel and three other friends end up dying. Authorities such as the dam operators and the, the local safety officials, they had protocols. They had ways to stop this kind of thing to happen because they didn't want people to end up in the pool where they were. Well, what it turned out, they had a sign that said, danger, stay away. Somebody had decided it would be funny to steal that sign two weeks before the tragedy. On that fateful day, Despite the presence of warning signs about the scheduled water release, the group of friends, including Rachel, may not have fully understood the imminent danger. Authorities are there for a reason. And we could be known as children of obedience. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.